Hey everyone, just a quick note before this episode starts. I um, want to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. It's the best way to keep track with all things do for one. We send them at least once and no more than three times per month. We don't want to annoy you. And we update you on podcast episodes, written stories posted on our blog, events that might interest you, and different ways that you can support us. And if you enjoy listening to these, please help spread the word. Trust me, our guests would love for their stories to be heard by many, including, and I'll say especially, the guest you'll hear from today. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a... But, uh, but, uh, oh, I'll never get, I'll never get this thing off. What is life anyway? Oh, he will always bang his hand on, on the piano like that. <laughs> but he can't think of another word. In this episode, my name is Devin Ray Hillary. You'll meet Devin. And I'm the author of the book subtitled, Life Experiences with Autism and Mild Intellectual Disability. And that's the thing that I want everybody to know. Did I have, did I, did, did I have my books and copies for sale online, in stores, and especially at home? And we'll leave a link for you to purchase his book wherever you're listening. In this episode, you'll hear Devin discuss many topics he covers in his book. He'll tell us about the joys of his life, the challenges of his life, and how he overcomes them. His story will prompt us to ask questions like, should people with disabilities learn to adapt to societal norms? Or should society try to better understand and be willing to adapt themselves in order to cultivate better places of belonging and growth? I'm also a former member of Nanaya Corral since 2007 until 2013, which was my extraordinary year of graduating out of college completely. And I selected a couple of songs throughout this episode brought to you straight from the man himself, Devin Ray Hillary playing piano and organ from his YouTube channel. There's a lot of talk of autism these days. Over $1 billion has been spent on autism research in the last decade. It can be a complicated topic, so let me highlight just a couple of things I think serves as a helpful backdrop. Since the 1990s, the number of people diagnosed with autism has exploded. According to the Centers for Disease Control, as of 2018, autism has affected an estimated of 1 in 59 children in the United States. There are many reasons people argue as to why. One prominent theory is that it's because the characteristics that are considered common among people on the spectrum is widening more and more. A few behaviors that are tied to the single name, autism, are difficulties in communication, failure to relate to others, repetitive movement such as body rocking or hand flapping, resistance to change, and compulsive behaviors. It may also include focused abilities that stand out, like people who excel in math, English, or music. In the United States, much of our understanding of autism originates from Leo Connor. He was an Austrian-American psychiatrist, physician, and social activist, and is best known for his work related to autism. He published a very influential article in 1943 titled, Autistic Disturbances of Effective Contact. He did this by observing 11 young children, and as it's written in this paper, they were considered to have seriously disordered behavior. He identified core characteristics of autism as the, quote, 
inability to relate themselves in the ordinary way to people and situations from the beginning of life. He described their challenges of relating to people as extreme aloneness. In Devin's book, he articulates the feeling this way. My life has been extremely abnormal and unordinary to other people. Most of them could barely cope, have interest, or even care for them in their own lives of ordinariness and normality, unless you are a human being who is autistic as me. In an article published in 2011 in the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Journal called Sowing the Seeds of the Autism Field by Jan Blatcher and Lisa Christensen, they analyze where the field has gone from Leo Connor's article to now. In this paper, they summarized recent research, as of 2011, that autism is now widely addressed in terms of a spectrum or continuum rather than one single disorder. They write that they believe Connor would be pleased by the growing perspective that we should recognize people as people and not define them by the disorder they have. And finally, we should allow people their independence and treat them humanely. As many of you are getting to know Devin, perhaps you know him as our MC at our Do For One Info sessions, you'll know that he's a powerful speaker on this very topic. If there was a change in society, there will be people who will not misinterpret of the people who are special need, especially myself. Of yeah, like like people can kept kept on asking, I uh, kept what you would ask um, are you, are you feeling okay, sir? Um, yes, I'm okay. So why keep on moving like? So why keep on rocking like that? And I would say, for example, I'm sorry. It's a part of my disability. In chapter one of his book, Devin writes, On Saturday, December 13th, 1986, as a Jamaican Caribbean descendant, I was born at the Jacoby Hospital located in Pelham Parkway in the Bronx, New York. I was the last child of my mother. That made me the youngest of nine siblings, three brothers and five sisters. I was told that when I was a baby, I would cry out loud like life's crazy. Yes. So totally. Let me start with this with this question. What are some of your favorite memories of childhood? Hmm. Wow. Well, 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 most of my favorite memories of childhood is like riding on the New York City subway with my mother, mo- mostly on the elevated lines, and I would bang the same rhythm. How how the train would pass by like this. Yes. Yeah, so there were two old time trains. The Red Birds from the sixties and the Silver Bullets, which is nicknamed the R sixty two from the eighties. But what extraordin extraordinary excuse me. But what really amazed me are those longer trains and that's so we- weird to me. I'm I didn't know there were two types of subways, the numbered subways and the lettered subways. I was too young to know this, honestly, mm. really. And that's, one, that's just only one of the things of my childhood. Actually, I have, a, I have a, a part of your book you wrote about, and that's something that you didn't mention that I'll bring out right now since we're talking about your favorite parts of childhood, mm-hmm. was food. Yes. Share a little bit about your favorite foods and memories of good food. Yeah, but the memories of good food are bar- mostly barbecue food. I like barbecue hamburgers, barbecued hot dogs, especially barbecue, especially steak, pork, and barbecued chicken. Yeah, but the craziest thing that I do with my hamburger is put um, all sort of um, sauces on there. But later I will find disgusting. But that's the way how I felt. What I would put in my hamburger is not only ketchup or barbecue sauce alone. As a matter of fact, however, um, get, yeah, let me get away from the barbecue sauce because I didn't use it back then. 
I was using the catcher mostly. Devin is fortunate to have very caring parents and to belong to a large family. Many of his experiences in life come from his relationship to them. His favorite experiences in his childhood go beyond the food and the special sauces because he associates this food with good company. But I think, it, I think in my opinion, it was just showing everybody how much I'm having fun um, in, in the outdoors, especially with company around me, mm. honestly. Yeah, what kind of company? Uh, mo- mostly that are my, my family, my, my family that usually come. It was back at, um, it was back um, at East 165th Street, living in the New York City housing in the, in the Bronx. And Devin goes on to share so much and in detail about his childhood. One major turning point for Devin, as it is for many, was when he started school, where he meets new people, teachers, and students. Being known and understood is a blank slate. No family around at school to help positively represent him. Devin doesn't share as much about the challenges he faced when he was in segregated special education. He shares much more about the bittersweet challenge of being moved from special ed to general ed. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I, I forgot to tell you of the biggest challenge. I should not forget this. Those teachers had found out that I'm very high functional and I'm bright that they encouraged me to go into inclusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but I keep on missing my special ed family, my special ed program, my special ed class. And hearing him talk about this, I was curious. So I asked him what he preferred, special ed or general ed? People with disabilities or people without disabilities? Hmm. You know what? I don't know. I'd rather be with both, the best of both worlds, as, as, lo- as long they don't show any discrimination and, um, and racism to me, no matter how different I am. This is interesting to me because it highlights the fact that simply bringing people into mainstream society is often much more complex than we realize. And Devin had support in his mainstream classes referred to as paraprofessionals. I know, there are a lot of good ones, but I'll pick one. Let's see. Let's see. Um, uh, oh, here's one. I got one. Okay. <clears throat> Are you ready? Go for it. Okay, let's do this. I used to have a female power professional. She was the power professional who had been supervising me. He could go on and on. I was 16 years old at that entire time. However, the whole problem was that she used to do a lot of things of supervising me, which I never liked or enjoyed from her. Um, that she used to do a lot of things of supervising me, which I never liked or enjoyed from her. And on about his experiences with them. Especially some to my special ed classmates of inclusion. I never liked the way how she... Here's an example of how one paraprofessional forced him to get wet in sprinklers when he clearly did not want to. Uh, yeah, especially especially for me going into the sprinklers, into the water during the summertime to get wet. Yeah, like one teacher would keep us saying, go get wet, go get wet. Yeah, as she, does, as she doesn't know that, and that female gym, gym teacher had taught me that, that, that my fearful look looked pathetic to her. But leave it to Devin to put a positive spin on it. Yeah, but the only but the only thing um, that, that I would uh, that, that I would try by sprinklers is when it is officially over. So one thing that we can highlight about the complications of social integration and integrated education is that one critique of paraprofessionals is If they provide too much support, then it prevents someone from learning independence and other competencies. It's back and forth between supporting while also being in tune to what level of independent learning is possible and then stepping back to allow that growth to take place. There were some positive examples that Devin shared about people helping. Or at least trying to. One of my church people had t- had taught me one thing, even though it didn't help help me out, but it did help in some sort of way. 
she taught me to say to myself, I'm not going to rock. She let me do it over and over again by myself, by myself when she's not around, especially when I'm with my parents saying, I'm not going to rock. 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 But even though I still do it, I still rock. Y- yeah, but it's been, it's been helping me some sort of way. I would stop rocking at times, you know? It helps you sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, think, um, do you think it's your responsibility to stop rocking, or do you think society needs to understand why you do it? Hmm. Wow. That is a tough question. I think that I think that the I think the society should understand of of why of why I of why I do that. But even though however at the same time I should continue learning how to conduct myself no matter how special need I am. So, but despite all these struggles, Devin maintains a wise perspective, and he's grateful for the general education experiences that he's had. But at yeah, but at the same time, I do I do feel okay that I'm that that, that I've grown that I've grown out of that I feel grown out of those things, and I'm and and being in the general ed life, despite how special I am, and made me stronger and tougher than ever before. Mm-hmm. You I know, can, I can see that. Yeah. It makes my life more complicated, as especially as I've been growing up, even though I did have enjoyments of my own on the other hand. Fasting forward a bit, among the many things that Devin should be proud of, he's most proud of graduating out of college. Um, yes, I'm proud that I'm a very different person than how I was before. Um, mostly, mostly how I graduated from college and bring me open, more open doors to life. That was um, that make me feel sure that I want to do in my future. Yeah, and it bring me and it bring me a lot of open doors, and it bring me a lot of open doors. Um, and 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 help me grow more, more maturely, less naive, especially grow more spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, physically, etc. Make me more stronger myself. It's always amazing to see people on the spectrum of autism finding ways to express themselves and relate to others. For Devin, one of his ways is through music which was his major in college. Here's another interesting example. In a recent TED Talk, Hannah Gatsby discusses her diagnosis. She describes finding her way by using the analogy, finding the doorway to the eye of the storm. Listen to this, she says, apart from the usual way us spectrum types find our calm, repetitive behaviors, routine, and obsessive thinking, I have another surprising doorway into the eye of the storm. Stand-up comedy. How so? Well, she describes how in conversation with people, there's a lot to process at once. She says, my thought process is not linear. I'm a visual thinker. I see my thoughts. I don't have a photographic memory, and nor is my head a static gallery of sensibly collected think pieces. It's more that I've got this ever-evolving language of hieroglyphics that I've developed and can understand fluently and think deeply with. But I struggle to translate. She goes on here and concludes with this. All this to say, I've always understood far more than I've ever been able to communicate. As for stand-up comedy, she found this as a way to come across to people because, quote, I don't really have to talk. Because strictly speaking, I'm reciting. So all that is left for me to do is my best to make a genuine connection with my audience. So as stories and examples like this continue to make their way to the general public, we learn and we find it fascinating and inspiring. Still, the reality is that it's a constant struggle for many to truly relate and find meaning in their lives. Devin writes, My tough and stressful life with autism and mild intellectual disability has never ever been dreamy, fake, made up, mythical, fictional, 
or even an illusion, act, joke, bluff, or fairy tale at all. It has all been true, non-fictional, and serious in real life. I asked Devin if he could talk more about this. Wow. Those people don't know or realize that I'm not planning anything hypocritical. It's just my behavior that's really, my disability that's controlling me. That Yeah, that's really the thing. Like, for example, when I say say nice thing to people, they take it offensively, or when I rock back and forth, little did I know that would scare people, and I would not mean to. In previous episodes, we talked about some common negative assumptions that people make about people with disabilities. Innocent victims of fate, the sick patient, and incapable of participating in community. Devin is pointing out yet another common one. The assumption that someone with an intellectual disability is deviant or dangerous. And I was reading an article lately of how police violence is a is really a problem these days and why these cops need training to treat um, special need people, especially um, others with autism, especially, especially myself. Devin is fortunate to have had incredible parents who understand him and support him. I haven't mentioned this yet, but Devin talked about his childhood and how his father stayed home while his mother worked so that each and every day he could help him get ready for school and be there when he got back. And as you heard, Devin has a lot of, a lot of good memories of childhood, riding the subway and understanding the subway system. But as an adult, getting out there in the general public, he has a lot of fear in traveling because of all the misunderstandings of his behavior. I feel free and okay when I'm going on independently, but I feel fearful that something bad might happen to me and misinterpret me and people will misinterpret me at any time. And now we get and, and now we get and now we get caught of of people thinking what I'm doing is a problem and they don't know it's nothing problematic to me. They don't understand of why I'm behaving what I'm doing as part of my disability. As we continue talking in this direction I discovered perhaps an underlying perspective that helps Devin navigate and overcome these challenges. It it hurts me because I can imagine that it would be hurtful. Like, Mm -hmm. Like, here I am, I'm just trying to be kind, I'm just trying to get from point A to point B. Yeah, but, and when I try to do good to people, they would just re, they, would, they, they would not care what I say. They just want to, want to be left alone because I'm being trouble to them. And that's, and that's really sad. That's really sad they don't want for me to hear what I have to say. And, and you know what? It reminds it, it kind of reminds me of Jesus that he'd been through that fate. Like, that, that he is the son of God trying to destroy us for our sins, but... The people's heart would not believe. They would ignore him and do things like him. They would nail him to a tree and they would and they would threaten him to be crucified, which was done. But he paid for the pay pay for his sins so we don't have to pay the punishments for our own. You know? So we don't have to leave this world until it's time our own time to leave this world. Like I wish not to be in the same faith as Jesus, even though he was the only, he was the Messiah that saved us all, um, to pay for our to pay for our sins, you know. And then I said, "Wow, God is good." And he said, "He's great. He's more than good. He's awesome than than any single human being." King and King and Lord of Lords, Masters of Masters, therapists of all therapists, counselors of all counselors, life coaches of all life coaches. He's everything. He's the flagship of the of both Earth and outer space, especially the entire universe. He's the one that created the heaven and the earth. Yeah, we love him because he first loved us. And as I said before, without God. Our life is useless. Devin has a lot to be proud of. Graduating college, his musical talents, his book, his faith. God has really helped me in my journey of of making me 
feel safe as I'm traveling independently these days. It's it's kind of yeah, it's really rare these days. Um, and that's one of and that's one of the things how I thank God of make of helping me, of keeping me safe through all this trouble and 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 show and been the only compass to show my way home. And and he would hear my prayers before I would go out, especially especially when I come back at home. I would just say thank you, Lord, for bringing me back home. And of course, he still has aspirations. These days, um, I'm trying to, I'm I've been practicing on my music and hoping and praying that um, I would get I would get a real job in music and um and and uh, but I'm look but at the meantime I'm looking for job training a, a a trade of something what I could do. As this episode comes to a close, I thought I'd play a clip of Devin and I rehearsing for a fundraiser in East Queens hosted by Hope Church. Devin and I are going to teach you a song written by Barry McGuire. It's called Seeds of Love. And when you learn the chorus, we would like to invite you to sing it with us. Let this be our anthem for planting seeds of kindness, planting them row by row right here in New York City. The the world that we live into may be corrupted with sin, but we can plant brand new seeds of kindness and friendship in the name of love, especially with people with disabilities. Thanks so much for listening. Again, like I said at the beginning, um, keep track with us by signing up for our newsletter, which can be found at doforone.org. And please share these stories with your friends. I know Devin would sure appreciate that. (laughs) All right, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, but no matter how I... Yeah, but no matter how I live, I live in all God's hands um, whatsoever. Without Him, I'm nothing. Thank you very much. Give it up for Devin. In New York City alone, there are over 900,000 people with some kind of disability. Negative perceptions, segregation, loneliness, and neglect are common experiences for many. I think before even thinking about ramps and elevators, I think just an openness to invite a person with a disability somewhere, I think that speaks accessibility in greater volumes than having a ramp legally somewhere just for the sake of it. You know, because we can have a ramp or an elevator, but if there's never anyone to use it, then there's really no point. Do For One promotes stronger communities and richer lives by bringing people excluded from freely given support into healthy and lasting relationships. Friendship, spokesmanship, social support, and social change can emerge when people's gifts and concerns are brought into the center of community life. Visit doforone.org to learn more.